recording. All right, Hi, Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Hello. Um, Jessica Irons. She is um, a, board, a Bethany Arts Community board member. She was part of the founding of it. But she is the founder and an educator of Theater O in Ossining, which is a community theater program. And they do wonderful programs for children and presentations. And they've been working directly with Bethany Arts Community, having some of their programs in the Bethany Arts Community and also some of their presentations there. Yeah. And Jessica, would you like to talk a little bit about Bethany and? Sure. Um, yes, I would love to. I'm going to use my cheat sheet. Good. <laughs> First, welcome. <laughs> so nice. Hold on. There we go. There's my cheat sheet. Um, so Bethany is 40 Somerstown Road in Ossining, New York. It's a beautiful facility. Uh, it, the mission of Bethany is to create a space and environment where many forms of art can be learned, produced, and flourish, a space where artists of all ages and levels of experience are welcome to explore and create art for the community to experience and engage with while enhancing their perception and perspective of the world. And David Lyons, who is our founder, from the very beginning, his vision has, core to his vision has been the introduction of arts at an early age, opportunities to create without fear, and that those things will make a better future for our children and for the whole society. We have studios for local artists. We have a performance space, which I use a lot. Um, not right now, but <laughs> in other times. Um, we have a dance rehearsal space. We have dorms for resident artists who come and stay with us. We have, um, we have studios for our resident artists. We have many different collaboration spaces pop throughout the building. We have um, classrooms for after school programs and for um, really educational programming for students of all ages. Um, and I do want to tell you that the staff has said what a delight it has been to work with you, and Kathy and Marty, that they just have thoroughly enjoyed this experience. And I wanted to say, Kathy, we started talking about this. We did, we did. Like, we I think it's like a year ago. <laughs> and, it could not be a more appropriate time to celebrate the art of our educators. Right. It really, like, superheroes. And I am so delighted that this is happening right at the beginning of the school year, this, like, crazy thing where what you guys are doing is bringing beauty into our kids' world, and we get to celebrate your artistic expression that makes i'm i'm very proud of that i'm really thank glad you, jessica. You're there. i really want to thank jessica because it is through her that we did manage to have this collaboration jessica reached out to me um we, we began talking about it at um at bus duty time actually while she was yeah. driving <laughs> <laughs> and i was uh, ushering them into school and she reached out to me and asked at the time that couldn't have been more perfect. The yeah. show was originally thought of as um, a way for art teachers who had been stuck in their own homes during the lockdown to show what they had been doing, how they had been processing their art. And at a meeting of NYSADA, we discussed the theme and came up with the title, <laughs> Art in the Days of COVID. And Really, it was how people are in their own environment processing what's going on around them through art. And with that, I'd really love to introduce Sharon Chacon, and she is going to talk about art education and the types of things that are happening in art education now with all of our positive twists. <laughs> and Sharon Chacon is the past president of NYSADA, 
and she's a current art teacher, and she's going to talk to us about Nosada. Thank you so much. I'm really, I'm so excited and just honored to be here. Um, I am the past president of Nisada, which means I just ended my um, four year term as president and president elect and past president of the New York State Art Teachers Association, which was such an incredible honor to be a part of. Um, but of course, um, more importantly, all of that began right here in the leadership community of Region 7. And um, Region 7 is just a really vibrant um, chapter of NYSADA and all of the art teachers here, which you are seeing that leadership in Marty Merchant, Monica Shore, and of course, um, also with uh, Kathy Ibanez, who has just been really in influential in making all of this happen. So we're so excited to really showcase that leadership. So thank you very much for that. Um, but Definitely having that role and being a part of the New York State Art Teachers Association and being a part of this whole New York State network of teachers. There's been many things that have been happening, obviously, um, with the onset of COVID and what that meant for our, our craft and, and how we work with students has changed dramatically. And I when we look at some of the challenges, there's been many challenges, but there's also been a lot of really incredible things that have happened as well. Certainly the challenge began the day that all of us were sent home and we had no idea what that was going to look like for any of us. Um, basically on a Friday afternoon, we knew that students were going home, they were going home with limited materials and we didn't know what Monday was going to look like. Um, teachers came together in all districts all across the state trying to figure out how are we going to deal with what education and 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 art looked like for our students but i think very quickly we all realized that hey we can do this <laughs> and i think that's the most amazing resilience that comes from not only teachers and the things that we deal with every day in our own classrooms but the students as well the one thing that arts education brings for our students is the idea that we we need to fluctuate and and have these different experiences and how we react to them is an important part of what we do. We're used to teaching children about, you know, things things happen, we deal with failure, we deal with mistakes, and then we change and we redirect how we're going to work with them. Um, we also work with students to deal with how we think about life in general and how we think about what happens the world around us and how can we use the arts to mirror that but also to help us to reflect and to change the way we react to that so i think if there's anything to say about this entire experience is that not only did art educators have this but i think our students did as well and when they came to us on a daily basis or came to us through what we call asynchronous learning, um, we were used to having to be thinkers. We were used to having to take what was in front of us and to put our own spin on it. And that's what we teach our students to do. Um, so it was a difficult scenario and what I can say about the New York State Art Teachers Association and especially Region 7, which um, Westchester is a part of, that Region 7 came together as a community. And art is about community. We came together as educators. We came together to learn, to hone our craft, to figure out what are each of you doing that is really extraordinary and how can we incorporate that? How can we alter and change the way we teach art education every day and make this matter for our students? So I'm really proud and honored to be a part of that. And I'm really excited about the art teachers that came to give their expertise and knowledge and to explore new possibilities. And I was saying earlier that I just can't help but see the positives in all of this. So in all of these challenges and difficulties, there's incredible positives that came out of every single moment 
of what we went through and what our students went through and how we came through on the other end. Um, one of the things that happened in Region 7, which was really incredible, is that we had we had immediately come together. Um, Sherry Altieri was one of our leaders in the region who had really a, a great grasp on what it looks like to be in a digital world. And she came and said, hey, listen, I'm really interested in sharing some of this expertise and what this looks like in our education. And she stepped forward and she put together some incredible workshops for us and brought art educators and an opportunity to share their expertise and come together and, and work on what that would look like for our students. And that was a really exceptional thing that happened almost immediately. And it was amazing to see all the different skills that people had and how we could share that with one another. But when we look at some of the bigger challenges, most of this comes down to really big questions. And probably the most important question that all of us asked, we asked of ourselves as educators, we looked at as far as what does this mean to educate students in this time period and in this venue, was what do our children need most? You know, what do we as artists need? What do our children need? It's the same thing. And, um, I think when we really looked at that question of what matters most right now, what matters to our students, it really changed the face of art education to a really fundamental level that might never be matched again. You know, when we look at the, um, the emotional issues, obviously, that was a huge factor of what does it mean to be separated by people who you're with every day? What does this mean to be locked in a place that maybe is not the safest place for you, which is a real reality for our students. We have students that their home life may not really be the safest, most um, flourishing place for them. And what does that mean? And how do we reach those children who their needs are different? They are right now in this moment going through something that we as educators need to address in a very different way. And I am so proud of the challenge that all of the art teachers that I have seen have really stepped up and have created a space and art experiences that allowed them to be human. And, uh, and there's nothing more that we could ask for, you know, from ourselves and from our students. So I think that that was a question. And those questions matter. What do my students really need now? How can I meet the needs of those students? And we were also sending them home to a, a place where Maybe it was a good place or not a good place that depended on the family, but also there was equity issues. There were issues of what do students even have at home? You know, I'm sending them home and, you know, they might have a pencil and a piece of lined paper and that's it if they're lucky. And when we think about what it means to be an artist and to really work with materials and express what we need to express through the manipulation of material, they didn't have traditional materials. So to really look at how can we, as art educators, work with what students have in their home? How can they find inspiration in their home? How can they look around their space in a different way? How can they look at the materials that they have at hand and realize that those are really important materials for art making? How can we manipulate them? How can we rearrange them? How can we think about them differently? So that was a really big challenge that I think that we as art educators really stepped up and were able to tap into in a very different way, which really speaks to contemporary work. You know, contemporary artists aren't dealing necessarily with traditional materials, but they're playing and exploring their world and the materials that they have at hand and looking at those in a very different way. So coming from this place of being trapped in a home, 
being trapped with family, thinking about your experience at home. <laughs> you know, we all went through this together. Um, and how do we find inspiration in that? In addition to that, we also were tapping into students' imagination and how to think about what we contain inside of ourselves and how we can use that to expand our world when we are trapped in these little four walls and expanding on that in immense ways. Um, I can say that teachers certainly were challenged with technology, but all of us have come out on the other end with these incredible skills and um, ways of reimagining what education can be. And that's a really positive aspect of what has happened for us and these challenges. I can also say that um, a lot of us as art educators, we think about, and certainly um, working in a community arts center, right? That we think about advocacy all the time. How do we advocate for the arts and what this means to not only a child, but to ourselves? I mean, we're all sitting here, we're all artists. <laughs> so we understand the art world, we understand what it means. But for these young students, it was a very different thing. Um, but when we look at that um, and tapping into what it means to be an artist in this, in this kind of time, it really expands those ideas. Um, oh, I had a train of thought and I think I just might have lost it there for a moment, but um, really just the advocacy issue, that's where I was going. Um, the advocacy issue, which we're all advocating for what this means and why it's so important to think about the arts and especially in this kind of time period. But when we're going into a home, just as we are now. I mean, we've just all intruded in each other's spaces and we've intruded into another realm. And, you know, sometimes we're dealing, we're, we're not only just talking to the student, but we're talking to the parents who are sitting behind the screen. You know, today, I can't tell you how many grandparents that I was speaking to or today, how many babysitters who joined in on our art making experience. <laughs> When I look at, and Marty, he gets this because he's a grandparent. <laughs> but, you know, when I think about how our voice right now is going into places that it never existed before and how incredibly important that is. We're not just speaking to the students who are in front of our screen, but we're speaking to the person who's sitting behind the screen. And um, I know for myself and for many other art educators right now, we're inviting people into our art world because they're there, they're helping, they're listening. And that voice is resonating so much farther than I think we ever imagined it would. And especially when we think about how we deal with contemporary arts today, what a lot of our grandparents experienced in their maybe limited art experience or to this little classroom, we may be expanding, you know, beyond what they ever experienced before. So I feel like we're, we're performing so many different services right now that go beyond what used to happen in our classroom. And that's a really beautiful, exciting thing. So I tend to look at this, at the positives of um, what this has become that we never expected, what the virtual world means to a larger expansive audience. Um, when we think about art in the time of COVID and just who we as artists, and I'm sitting around a room full of artists right now, even though you can't see all of them, um, you know, every Friday, we as artists were meeting as a group and honestly we probably never would have done that and met that many times if it wasn't for this time period so although there's these many challenges that have happened there's these many gifts that have been given to and um you know i think about time slowing down and all of us just being able to take a breath and think about 
you know, what does art mean to us? And I know for myself personally, as an artist, I've really slowed down to think about my own personal voice and how I can help my students find their personal voice in a very different way than I probably ever have in my life. So with every negative brings a positive. So that's how I'm going to leave my role at the moment as uh, past president of NYSADA and some of the challenges that are happening across the state. We all have different uh, programs. We all obviously have very different equity issues. We all have different, um, uh, different districts and how they're dealing with it. I personally am very blessed to be in a district for 25 years. Um, and I'm very thankful that they have listened to my personal voice and have helped me through a lot of this challenge. So I'm going to pass that on back. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Sharon. That really opened up a lot of, um, of insight into what's going on with art education. And Marty, would you like to talk a little bit about um, the show? Would you like to, would you like to, oh yeah, <laughs> would you like to talk um, or introduce some of the other artists that are here? We could have a little bit of a discussion about how things are going within the various classrooms. Well, we do have, uh, we do have several artists that are in the show that are present. And I want to thank Sharon for being so articulate and, uh, and for being positive. Um, because there are, are many aspects, which we're not discussing, but there are many aspects of our, of our lives, professionally and personally, that are, that are difficult and are challenging and are frustrating. And um, it's always good to hear a clear voice that brings a little sunshine. And it's, <laughs> not, just, and it's not just a thin, you know, ray of light. It, just, it was very substantial. So thank you, Sharon. It was great listening to you, as it always is. Um, and if we kind of turn our turn our thoughts now to the show, um, I think that uh, uh, one of the things that I was most curious about when we were putting the show together, um, Eric Storms, one of the uh, one of the artists in the show, he's the one that thought of this um, takeoff on that uh, on the novel by Marquez that art in the time of COVID, and I was really curious to see how artists and 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 the artists that are represented in the show. They're not just artists, but they're artists who teach. So they're just as Sharon so so eloquently described. We're so um, uh, we're so involved in the inner lives and the imagination of our students, who are under perhaps even more pressure or or facing more frustrations in their little lives or or adolescent lives than than we're even aware of. So I was really curious, what will we be doing? Will, how will we, how will, will we use our art being as, as a way to find our, our, our voice? Um, uh, it's going to, I, I assume that there would be pieces that are, that look therapeutic, you know, that, that looked like they were trying to find um, areas of peace and calm in their, in their quest for, for some kind of visual that, that took them, took them away or removed them. Um, I suspected that there would be artists that faced the issue, the, the, the monster, the, the, the evil face on and tried to give that some sort of coherence. Um, there were people who, who would be turning, you know, if there, if there are 17, 15, 20 different artists, there were going to be 20 different methods of, of reaction, 20 different methods of synthesizing, synthesizing thoughts. So, um, and I think we have that kind of that spectrum, that broad, broad um, range of, of of approaches and thinking and ways of dealing with things. And yet, you know, as you go through the show, I, I think you'll see some, things that are calming and, and placid and soothing. Um, there are things that are upsetting and dissonant and acidic. Uh, you know, there's there's this whole variety. I guess just as much as variety as there in, is is in human thought. So um, I wouldn't mind uh, taking, uh, asking, first of all, if there are artists present who would like to speak very briefly, maybe 60 seconds, um, about their process, or we could simply start going through the work 
will find work that uh, belongs to the artists that are present and they can address those specifics. Which, how should we proceed? What's the, uh, what's the consensus? I think that sounds good. Shall we um, show the slides and then as they come up, we'll... Uh... Yeah, so you can share your screen because Sharon, uh, uh, Kathy, you've got, uh, you've got the uh, show uh, on your, there we go. Yes, I do. I'm going to go back to the first slide. I'm going very quickly back to the beginning, sorry. <laughs> Okay, this is slide one. Okay, now that artist I don't believe is present. No. Um, so if you want to advance, uh, I don't think Betsy's present. Um, uh, now there's Amanda's picture, Ponder. Amanda, um, could you, uh, would you like to say a, a few words about what, what brought you or why did you decide that this was what you wanted to say? Maybe that's the wrong question, but. Uh, no, I, 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 I get it and I'm, I'm, I'm very, you know, inspired by your discussion about how artists have taken the whole spectrum of whether they're going to show their work that maybe brings them a sense of peace or calm versus work that maybe expresses the anxieties and the fears of our current situation. And there's a part of me that like wishes I made art that was maybe more political or reactionary, but um, there's a huge part of me that just needs to make work that I feel um, good about in terms of creating and, and viewing. And I was thinking about um, koi fish paintings for a very long time. And this situation that we're in being home more often uh, quite frankly, is giving me an opportunity to create more work and being a part of an artist community, um, you know, has really inspired me to kind of push a little further and think about my work more and finally do the art that I've been waiting to do for a very long time. Uh -huh. um, if you know my previous wor work, it's like got a lot of organic sort of jellyfish feel to it. So I've always been interested in a lot of movement in my work. So this photo was based on actually um, two things quickly. Um, my trip to Japan, which I was trying to incorporate a lot of my photos that I took in Japan, but also I took a little journey with Gina. <laughs> Shout out to Gina Palmer and Sharon. And we had a lovely day at a farm in Rhinebeck where there was a koi pond. And I sort of combined a bunch of photos that I had taken of these beautiful koi fish just swimming in the pond as if nothing else <laughs> was different in their world. And um, just the beauty and the movement and calmness. And so it's called Ponder just because I think that this is our opportunity and, and thinking about some of the positive, as horrible as some of these things are, there's a lot of positives to be, being given the space perhaps to, to really be self-reflective and think about others in a different way and think about how we see the world in a different way. So that's what this piece is sort of my expression of. Well, one of the things that, uh, that um, you miss by just seeing a reproduction of this on your screen is the physicality of this, of this, uh, of this the delicious uh, painting. I mean, it's big, surface. it's big, yeah. yeah. We were talking before about the surface of it. it you know, it has a, a shimmering kind of translucency and, and uh, you know, uh, you can, uh, I get the I get the sense I get the, I get the feeling of of this floating and this depth and yeah. um, it really is a uh, a, a very uh, a soothing kind of presence it really mm -hmm. is it really yeah, is I want I wanted to feel like you were actually looking into the pond you know with the high gloss epoxy and you know that sort of bringing you back to a place like that um, that was sort of frozen in time so thank you thank you appreciate that thanks thanks um. Uh, I think uh, Kathy, uh, I saw Holly uh, come in. So uh, to, in, in order to contrast, sure, with Ponder, Holly? let's go take a look at one of Holly's pieces. Holly, are you there? Holly, you want to unmute? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Holly, uh, we're putting you on the spot. Um, oh, God. Uh, we, were, we were just talking to, uh, to, um, to uh, uh, Amanda. Amanda, thank you. <laughs> to Amanda about um, the, 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 uh, the expressive quality of, of her painting, which was, which was rather um, serene. Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be nice to jump across the, 
the, the some sort of emotional divide and yeah. maybe take a look at uh, show the show the next one uh, uh, or the next one yeah there yeah. So this is a, this is a big piece do you want to you want to talk to us about um, you're very in your artist statement you you said some very uh, interesting interesting things about how you um, uh, you 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 said I instill comfort nostalgia nature and memory mm -hmm. I literally and figuratively peel tear sew stretch and shield various formal abstract elements so that yeah. sounds a little bit different I get flowery with words well, well no but it's a, <laughs> but this is this is obviously this tangle of of material is uh, yeah. got a different kind of impetus behind it. You want to want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, this is what happens when koi explode, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's sort of like, you know, yeah, like taking like childhood stuff, like like you know, this fabrics that you just like, you know, kids have their binkies, you know, and their blankies and their things they like to touch and hold that give them comfort. But then, what happens when you put you know all the crap that comes to adulthood into it i don't know like all the anxiety all the craziness all the all the worry you know um so it's like comforting but there's a gear to it as well yeah and god especially in these times man oh my god like it's like making these sort of gave me comfort um but at the same time it's like you know it, it is that manifestation of just all the anxieties that come with lots of things in life and everything, especially these times. So when yeah. I look at it, I think of the word snarl. You think of the word what? Snarl. I think of the word snarl. snarl. Yeah. You know I mean? yeah. A, this is a, this is a, it, it, and again, one, one guy's opinion, but it's, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a aggressive, a threatening kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I would want to just ask you a question about you. Do you yeah. become do you become calmer having uh, assembled this or is yeah, this a like like great it's manifestation of yeah of like doing it the... yeah like doing it makes me very calm and quiet and focused but at the same time the outcome obviously causes people to be frightened of it yeah <laughs> you know? um, but but yeah because it's kind of both you know and it's like. I think life is kind of both, you know, life is something that you run to and run from constantly, you know, and it's just like, um, yeah, you know, but again, that, again, the physicality and, and part of it too is that, again, I, I teach graphics when I teach. So it's like, I'm, I'm all hands off when it, and pressing buttons when it comes to like my professional life. So it's like, when I do my own work, it's like, God, as much as I can, claw into it you know and and really get into it because um, it says all your all your work at, at the duchess community yeah. college it's uh it's flat yeah it's, so yeah, it's like flat flat surfaces and this is yeah it's digital it's it's all pixels you know and and yet here it's like i you know don't want to do that in my own art at all like i want to just really dig in and, and use physical objects yeah physical it's materials it's funny when i first got to know you and i knew what you did as a, <laughs> as a professor um, yeah. i was so surprised to see these so kinds of things you know <laughs> yeah well it's that you seem like such a nice right? person thank you yeah. <laughs> you seem so that's what my freshman college roommate said because i was like the one girl in the whole college that didn't play lacrosse wasn't a cheerleader and wore like a velvet cape and she was like, I was afraid of you the whole first half of the semester, but you're actually really nice. I thought you were on drugs and frightening, but no, you're actually I'm like, oh my God, dude. You know, so I get all that out. I'm nice on the inside, but, um, but that's the thing too with the artwork as well is like, um, I was sort of framed by this one question I was asked when I went to um, the Art Institute in Chicago after my first college that was all preppy. Uh, and, and the the teacher the first thing she asked the first day was how long do you want your work to last you know how long do you want it to be around and i was like god i don't care you know like it could be around minutes you know it doesn't have to be around years and forever and the idea that like art's not precious to me like it should yeah, i'm so sorry my cat's trying to get into his treats if you're hearing <laughs> frankly, well, i think you that. know as long as we're as long as we're uh we're, we're we're taking a look at what might one yeah. might imagine to be the the, the visualization of the of the crinkle the, yeah uh, Pat, patty tyrell's been with us for since the beginning yeah. of our talk patty are you there 
Yes, I am. Can we, can we find one of Patty's? Patty's uh, working in the in the in the um, in the COVID theme too. Um, Patty, would you would you like to talk about one particular painting, or maybe the first one you did in the series, or? Um, I could talk about all of them because actually there's probably about a hundred of them. Wow. And um, so I started out. Uh, being inspired by, you know, those close-up photos of the coronavirus that you see that are really kind of beautiful. Have you seen them? Yes. This electron my microscope, you know, and I thought, oh my God, that's beautiful. And I really wanted to um, work with that theme. And at first I was trying to, I really do have hundreds of them. At first I was trying to do things like that would show the paths of contagion, like how many, you know, people got con contaminated from each little droplet. And then I was kind of going crazy and I realized I was really just enjoying making and composing and using color and using material. And I also had a real need in the spring when we were first all locked up, I had a real need to create a daily practice to uh, sustain myself, you know, like a time mm -hmm. to do yoga, a time to take a walk, a time to do a daily painting or two. And I just really adhered to this complete schedule and made hundreds of these paintings wow. that continued through the summer. But after a while, it was really just about really enjoying the material. And, you know, it, it was no longer about, oh, this is a coronavirus. It was just about uh, beauty and color and composition. You know, it's really interesting that, you know, to, to, to greatly oversimplify the, the human organism, um, one would suspect that uh, a certain kind of person or a certain kind of sensibility would run away from the, from facing, almost literally like you did, from facing this threat um, to not just to your, not just to your profession, but to your family and the, and, and the, political structure and econ the economy um and yet you somehow not just faced it but you plunged you plunged into it and you explored it and mined it and you some it sounds like to me you kind of broke through to to some kind of place mental mental place that uh, that uh, maybe maybe d d um uh not demystified it but um but uh, un undemonized it does that make sense yeah yeah and i got back to working every day which was you know something i've been wanting to do for a while and these actually came in real uh use to me in the classroom now that i'm you know we're not in the classroom but virtually this fall i opened up with an abstract art unit because i wanted everybody to just be loose and play and experiment and they were like, oh, what do you do? How do you do it? Where do you get ideas? And I showed them these. And I said, well, these were ideas I got from coronavirus pictures. And I showed them the pictures and the photographs. And then I showed them this. And then they were like, oh, you can do anything. It's like, yeah, you can. <laughs> you, you can find beauty and interest in anything, anywhere. Well, thanks. Sure. And thanks for all the effort, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> The, I would fun. love to, and, and I know uh, you, you, since you have been in the spotlight um, earlier this evening, uh, Kathy, um, I would really like to, we, I, I chose, or, um, you, you, you painted the painting that's sort of the, uh, in the mask figure um, of the person that we sort of used as our, not our logo, but we, we put it on all of our invitations. And, and uh, this is the first, this is the first visual I saw of of what somebody of what might be coming for the show, and I and I looked at it and I looked at it and I I couldn't tell the 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 figure's skin color, and then I saw there's this swirling galaxy of COVID behind it, and then there's this almost like a a, a DNA strand thing on the robe, and and then there was the mask, and then I saw the impression of the nose and the mouth under the mask, and then I. I saw goggles or glasses, and I thought, boy, this is, you know, it's pretty scary. And I thought, <laughs> this is this is a really a bold and, and, a, and a little intimidating statement. But the more I looked at it, the more it seemed to symbolize 
you know, it's not a it's not a joyous picture to me, but it's um, it's lively. It's it's uh, it's a Mardi Gras of, of COVID um, images. So, Corona so Kathy, talk to us a little bit about this. Well, Marty, you know, from my my previous work, I work extremely realistically, and during the COVID times, I was during the lockdown. I was processing a whole lot of information and going through a real sense of um, grief in missing my students and grief in missing that interaction with my students. And I kept trying to make um, something colorful and bright, but the imagery kept drawing me back to these very dissonant images. Uh, I was processing all the fear and all of the confusion and all of the science at the same time. Um, the colors surprised me even. They weren't colors that I'm usually drawn to, and it really helped me to kind of have a place, a safe place, to put that mixed bag of emotion, that corona coaster, that uh, feeling of, of being overwhelmed by all the things going on around me and not being able to be in control of any of them. So this particular image was inspired by all of the images of the healthcare workers coming out of their shifts mm -hmm. of hours and hours and hours of being in PPE and um, being surrounded by and coded by um, danger and fear and exhaustion. And I just put it all together into that uh, piece. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a lot of peace to have a place, a safe place to put all of that anxiety. I was able to then walk away from it to, to, experience the um, creation, the, cr the process of manipulating materials and manipulating, manipulating colors and, and patterns and texture. And it gave me a safe place to put all of that. Well, I really want to take this opportunity to thank you, not only for the image and the painting, but all the energy you put into putting the show together. I mean, you really uh, did single-handedly brought mm -hmm. a lot of threads together and did a lot of work. So. Marty, I have to say though, I never could have done it without your help. You were there every every single step of the way, and every time I thought, "Oh, this is overwhelming. I can't do it," you'd come up with the next step and the next step and the next step. So thank you, Marty, for laying the path and for making it possible. Uh, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people helped. I think what would be great now is uh, let's. Uh, Gina Palmer is an artist that's present, and uh, she. Um, uh, is well known for a long time to a lot of the members of uh, Isada Region 7. And so Gina, let, uh, let's find your work. And uh, I think it's, I think it's, Gina, where is it? It's uh, down further. There we down go. Further. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Gina, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about this print. Well, Gina Palmer, I'm retired. Um, that party that's going on down there with those other four people. I was supposed to be there tonight and I slacked off and missed a lot of good food and drinking. Uh, <laughs> I told them I would meet them here. Um, they're the reason for all of this craziness because they challenge me all the time as a group of people working together. Um, it's been fantastic. We've been doing this for maybe eight, 10 months and we really kind of uh, prompt one another and inspire one another and critique and just have great discussions. Um, so this was my attempt to break out of my black and white life of lino cuts and wood cuts. And uh, they're cheering me on down there, telling me I did it. But I'm still trying to sneak the lino cuts and wood cuts in again in a different way. And Marty, I have to thank you also because while I was working on these, I kept sending Marty slides like this one I really liked and I was really felt great about it. And then I would send Marty one and and then I'd go kill that one. I, I don't want that one. I can't do that one. This is the only one I'm, I'm leaving in. And we had this great back and forth dialogue about what was happening with it. And um, it's part jelly plate and part collage. And the pieces that have line work on them are pieces of other images of lino cuts. So I've been just kind of slashing and burning through the lino cuts and then looking at where they fit. So it's been a really fun process, but it's also been really slow to 
to go from making images for a client and you know straightforward black and white very straightforward narrative to finding your own language so i'm really making a big mess over here uh, trying to wander through some layers and some reflection and but i have a lot of support from all you guys and i want to thank you for that well gina i i know that i've i've heard your name spoken reverently um, oh, no. for the 10 15 years that i've known uh, people in uh, in isada region 7 and i know that you have a tremendous body of work that you've done um uh one fascinating thing one of the fascinating things about gina is that she's a, a real avid birder and uh, although I've only had been able to sit down and have a beer with her a couple of times to talk about birds, but but uh, she's she's the go-to person in our region for any information or. or I do slap a bird into my work here and there, you know, as we like to say in our group. <laughs> well, would you would you relate this somehow to in your thinking to the current COVID crisis, or is it something that this um, kind of work is totally separate? Well, no, I think that um, during this whole time, for me being retired also, um, and this great group challenging me, um, I've been reflecting a lot on, on how I can integrate new, you know, visual language into my work. So um, I did start with the jelly plates and, um, and started with some of those prompts um, and um, other folks in our group and other folks at Sagamore this summer um, gave great creativity stretches. Um, those creativity stretches had to do with things like calm and home and ways of, um, you know, just creating brainstorming and creating symbols or creating images that would help us start a work of art. So those resulted in some stencils that were sort of reflective of um just very simple basic back to basics kind of exploration that we were doing during covid and also i think some of the color choices you know that were they're very contrasty um there's a lot of you know there's a little bit of anxiety and energy in some of those shapes and um and certainly um i guess more of a reflection on nature and and people sitting still a little bit more and going outside and needing that contrast between their quarantine time and the outside. So I think that um, that was a, a, something that I was trying to express in that a bit. I mean, there were just lots of crazy things going on besides COVID, like fires and, you know, yeah, yeah. lots of other landscapey kinds of things. And, and it's also migration time, so. Well, I feel uh, personally, I, 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 my own, my own work tends to turn to the simplicity and the beauty of nature, and this would be a great time to go talk to Monica. Monica has. Uh, well, here's uh, one of Marty's since he was mentioning the simplicity. Well, no, let's uh, let's let's give Monica a chance. She's been sitting patiently at the, uh, at the uh, at the table there in the party group, and uh, and and Monica is one of the artists like like Amanda that uh, that uh, seemed to turn to. To, to nature and, and like Gina, um, seem to find some sort of, um, some sort of, uh, well, I'll let Monica talk. Monica? We're here, we were on mute, sorry. Yes. Oh, okay, cool. So Monica, Hi. Us, do you, would you like to talk about one rather than another? Um, yeah, sure, let's talk about this one. <laughs> All right, um, right. What, what I also love about my little group of friends here and my art friends is that they are pushing me to finish things because um, I will go down in my studio and I will just, I don't know, I putter. I putter around and I go from this thing to this thing to this thing to this thing and I'm not a finisher. I have piles and piles of UFOs, which uh, are my, <laughs> and the quilting uh, fabric world is called unfinished objects. I'm sure we all have those. And um, so, I finished things this summer and it was really, really, really nice. Um, so this is my new favorite thing to do. I love my sketchbook. Um, actually, that's what we were just talking about when we were on um, mute here. And um, and I just love drawing what I see when I go for walks. I will take them and sit on my back deck in the morning and I will just draw and draw. And um, I take walks with my girls and that's what we've been doing during COVID, um, you know, it's amazing to me. I love where I live. I love the Hudson Valley. 
I think of my road as a trail. It's just, I don't have to go to any fancy place in New Paltz, any kind of crowded people trail. I'm on a mountain and I'm so happy. And um, most people felt stuck and I wasn't stuck. I was beyond thrilled to talk to my art friends via Zoom, via whatever technological way we did it. Um, and I loved just uh, soaking in all of the things I wanted to do. So I wanna thank those friends of mine and also all the Sagamore friends and region seven because they kept, you know, we kept it, we tried to keep it going, you know, every Wednesday with a chat and somebody sharing some wonderful piece of information. Well, it's so. interesting that in the actual show, um, your work hangs very close to Holly's. Hmm. And so as you walk through and, and you're, you're, you're feeling the different, uh, uh, the different impressions that you're getting that are coming to you, you see a piece like this, next to Holly's um, large and snarly work. Um, you know, it's a, it, it's a, um, it's a real, I, I just was watching a cooking show, so it makes me think of a gumbo. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's, all, there's all kinds of stuff going on. All was kinds. that travel with Phil? <laughs> yes, actually, <laughs> yes. Show. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, and I hate to use a metaphor, but it, you know, it's, it's sweet, some, some stuff is sweet, some stuff is salty, some stuff is spicy. It's just a real, really rich gathering of ideas and expressions. So this would be a well, good time to talk to Sharon about her landscapes. So Sharon, why don't, we, why don't we take a look at one of yours and you can tell us. They're all, I think, a series from the same geographic area? Yes. Yes, they are. Actually, there's there's um, some others that go with this, but I just chose these three. So um, part of the biggest um, blow to my life with COVID was the lack of travel. Um, I just hit 40 countries and that was a really big milestone for me and I'm soon going to turn 50 and I was hoping that I would hit 50 countries by the time I was 50. Um, but Morocco, you know, people ask me all the time of your travels, what was the place that, you know, stood out to you most of all? And for me, it was Morocco. Um, so I had a, I had to cancel quite a few trips during this time and, and that's okay. I found other incredible gifts in my life. And part of that was the group of artists that have I've really connected with and have been able to just push myself and inspire, which we've talked about, and that was a really important thing. So giving up travel was okay. Um, I found other incredible gifts. And um, so I chose these pieces because for me, um, part of this time of COVID was having this time, time to reflect and time to think and time to try to find my own voice, which has been um, something that I really haven't had the time to take. And during this time period, I started 100 works of art. And um, I've been working on these 100 uh, periodically and in, and in different sporadic ways um, and just kind of coming in and out of different pieces of these 100. But these Morocco pieces were part of me trying to really, the beginning of me exploring, you know, what do these experiences mean in my life? And, and where, where do they land in my repertoire of how I want to really pursue my own art making? And, and in some instances, they're... Um, very immature and I think that I'm starting to push myself further but I was really trying to find this way of expressing these moments in my life and doing some visual research for myself and thinking about how I wanted to use all of these different art forms that I like from printmaking to collage which for me I print all of my own papers that I collage with and these underlying patterns and 
And I also started writing during this time, and nobody knows better than Marty how much writing for me is a struggle. So it's kind of funny that I would come to this writing part of my life um, where I started thinking about haiku, but an American form of haiku, not a Japanese form in a hundred percent that truest sense of what you think of Japanese haiku because the language is different. But thinking about these poems of short, long, short. So I started writing poetry to go along with my pieces and and the poetry didn't come in the beginning. The poetry kind of came in the middle. So I would think about all of these things, make these works and start them, and then start writing this poetry in between, and then kind of come back to the work and finish them. And so this has been for me a real journey. And I chose these pieces because number one, this is my one place in the world that if I could go back to, it's my do over day, my day in the Sahara desert. <laughs> but it was also this um, exploring this medium that I wanted to explore more and also this beginning of writing that is very difficult for me that I've been enjoying and has been. So my, my writing is actually the titles of my work. It's not um, something separate, but it's the title. So yeah, that's, that's where these pieces came. <laughs> that's something I, I, I noticed that uh, when you started to do this kind of work about how long the titles were. Very, uh, but, and, but, but it's descriptive and, and very poetic. So um, we have, uh, um, uh, I'd like to open the floor in the next two or three or four minutes to anybody who hasn't had a chance to talk, Andrew. Um, I don't recognize who you are. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you were an artist or just a participant. Um, but if there's somebody that we didn't call on that has work in the show that would like to talk about it briefly, now would be the time to speak up. Do we have any, anybody that would like to talk about their work? Plenty of artists here that, uh, that didn't attend that, uh, um, that might have something to say if, if, they're, uh, if they had a chance. I guess not. So what we should do then um, is... Uh, in the few minutes remaining to us, uh, I think that it would be great to hear um, for maybe 15 to 30 seconds from anybody who'd want to, any of the artists involved or any of the, the uh, participants who are just uh, viewers, um, what, what seemed to be different about making this kind of work? What, what if none of this had happened, what kind of work you know, what kind of work might you have produced? And how is this work different? How is this work, how does this work hinge on the current pandemic? And of course, as, as somebody mentioned, uh, as Sharon might, might have mentioned and other people have mentioned, it's not just the pandemic. Uh, like Gina said, it's the fires, um, it's, it's hurricanes. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, it's a, it's a, in, a, in a perverse way, it's a great time to be alive because there's just so much stuff going on in the world. And, 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 um, and how, how has your work been different? What has it done to, what, what has it released or what has it assuaged um, in, in your life? What has your work done? How have you retreated to it or how have you um, uh, broken through to something else? Just like 30 seconds. Anybody want to speak up just to kind of tie things up? Oh, gotta, go ahead. I'm going to take just a minute, Marty, to say um, when I was working on the pieces that I have in the show, it was, for me, really a lifesaver. I had gone through a real depression during that first part of the lockdown, and it wasn't so much fear of corona or things like that. I hadn't realized how much being in the presence of children creating art feeds my life oh, yeah, and to yeah. have that suddenly ripped from me. Mm. I was at a loss for who I was and was I relevant? Was I going to make it through this transition? And having a place to, um, to explore thoughts and feelings and ideas and, and create was extremely important. Wow, that's great. That's good. Uh, somebody else have something to contribute? Um, yes. Yeah, go I, ahead, I, Patty. I'd like to 
just say that during that time in the spring when we were first all locked away, I just, um, in some ways it was kind of a special time to have the whole world sort of stop. Like I just remembered, I couldn't hear planes flying overhead. I couldn't hear cars going by. I couldn't hear trains going by. And there was something about the stillness that just felt like you had to just kind of face yourself and face what it was that you had to do that you worked on. And there was just something very quiet and special about. Oh, that's about a great that. insight. Thanks, Patty. Uh, uh, Sharon, you wanted to say something. I do. I think, I think, you know, it's funny because a lot of us have really shared the same kind of sentiment that for all of, for a lot of us, it was, it was this purposeful slowing down of time and a time that none of us have ever been given. And it was a really great gift. And as much as, um, you know, school was one thing and teaching was one thing, you know, we're all teaching artists. And I think, especially for me, especially amongst this group of women that I'm sitting with, I never saw myself as a teaching artist. I felt like I was a teacher and an artist second. And I think that this time, more than anything, any other time in my life, I stopped and said, I want to be an artist and a teacher. And I think that that was a huge, and, and I think that's maybe a little different for me amongst the women that I'm sitting with is that I never had that confidence. I never had that strength in me. And part of that strength came from the women that I'm sitting with right now um, and their support and their encouragement and opening myself up to that, which I don't know if this didn't happen, if I would have ever had. And I think that um, it has just been so enriching for me and, and so fulfilling to really have just had the slowing of life and time to write and to think and to be in my thoughts and to be an artist and then take that back to my students has been invaluable. But, but I think finding myself in all of this has been the greatest gift that I could never give back. I agree. It was kind of like a rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm done. Posted my lessons. I did this. I did the laundry. I helped my kids. What can I do now? Oh, let me go to my studio. And it was so great to say, let me go to my studio. You know, I actually had that time and it was beautiful. Thanks, Monica. I'm a better teacher than I've ever been oh, because man. of this time. Great to hear. Um, Abby Lewis is here with us. She's the director of uh, Bethany Arts Community. Abby, would you like to say something, unmute and, and say something in closing? We've got just a couple minutes left. Sure. I just want to say thank you all for being here. Um, it's been wonderful to walk through the gallery in these last couple of weeks and see all of your work. And now to hear you each talk about those pieces is really is really wonderful. I, I, I'm not sure I would have described, um, is it Amanda's pieces as a snarl? <laughs> um, no, it was, it was, it was Holly. Holly's, Holly's uh, pieces. Three Holly's pieces. Yeah. I have to admit, they, 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 every time I walk by, it forces you to sort of stop and look. It looks a little different from each angle. Um, but I really appreciate it. And I literally appreciate hearing all of you talk about um, art and education and um, you know we at Bethany um, believe so much that exposure to art to children at a really age is critical um, the idea that that kids can learn how to create without fear um, means so much for them both in their social well-being as children but also as adults we live in a world where creativity innovation cultural understanding um, really, really is important. And as we look towards creating a better future, um, arts education um, uh, needs to be a core part of that. So thank you all for, for being this been, here. This has been great. This has been yes. great. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, Catherine, would you like to give us a, a benediction? I just want to say thank you all for coming out tonight. It was a wonderful evening, a wonderful discussion. It left me feeling really empowered and really uh, positive. Thank you. And so long, Andrew, whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Have a wonderful three-day weekend. Yay. <laughs> so long. Um, you want to stick around, Kathy? Sure. Just for a minute?
See you, see you guys later. Bye-bye. Kathy, I'm going to uh, stop recording now. Thank you. Yeah.